It's now time for me to introduce our final speaker, Jim Sillers. Um, Jim was elected to Westminster in 1970 as a Labour MP after having become politically active through the Fire Brigade Union. His strong left-wing view, left views and support for a powerful Scottish Parliament led him to leave the Labour Party and set up the Scottish Labour Party in the mid-1970s. After Thatcher's victory in the 1979 election, Jim joined the SNP and was a leading light in the 79 group, a socialist group within the party. He won a sensational by-election victory for the SNP in Govan in 1988 and became deputy leader for the party. Jim has never been afraid to criticise the SNP leadership over the years, but his opinions have always been respected and listened to, both inside and outside of the party. As we all know, he was married to Margot MacDonald and we are honoured that this will be his first speaking arrangement since her sad passing. Please welcome Jim. Well, I must tell you that I'm always surprised when there's a turnout to these meetings. Because Joanne Lamont, the leader of the Labour Party in Scotland, you may remember that stair-heed fight you had with Nicola. <laughs> well, during that stair-heed fight, she made this statement. We are not programmed genetically in Scotland to make political decisions. Now, that's a remarkable statement if you think about it. Of all the people in this world, whether it be in Fiji, Vanuatu, New Zealand, Australia, America, Canada, Barbados, they're all genetically programmed to make political decisions. But we are different. We are thick as mints. <laughs> So, speak for yourself. So here we are, thick as men's, but we've got the vote. Now, I want to put the campaign for independence in its proper historical perspective. And this is not done very often. We were part of the English stroke British Empire for a very long time. It was one of the biggest empires the world has ever seen, both in terms of territorial uh, reach and also power and wealth. But every empire, as history has shown, comes into a decline and position of fall. This one has been no different whatsoever. We are at the final end of the English stroke British Empire. And I'll give you examples of it. When I joined the Royal Navy in mid-1950s, we had a home fleet, a Mediterranean fleet, a Far East fleet, and a West Indies station. Today, they're building an aircraft carrier without having the aircraft to put on it. <laughs> And when those aircraft arrive in 2018, the US Congress last week noted they'll not be able to fire the weapons on board because they're skint and the program is poor. That's a sign. There's another sign. Do you remember the Queen's Jubilee? And she sailed up the Thames in that wee boat with the Duke of Edinburgh dressed as an admiral of the fleet. Why was she in a wee boat? Every other jubilee, the monarch has reviewed the fleet. There's no fleet to review. <laughs> and the reason is that they're at the nether end of empire. They don't have the power and wealth they had previously. They're going down the chute. And if we remain with them, 
will go down along with them. The national debt of the United Kingdom is 1.4 trillion, heading for 1.5 trillion by 2017. The individual debt in this country, that is mortgages, credit cards, unsecured loans, is 1.4 trillion pounds. The so-called recovery that they're boasting about at the present time is built on the same stand, sand as brought us to the crises in the first place. More government borrowing, more private borrowing. And it will come to a cataclysmic end after the general election next year. £25 billion pounds worth of cuts are already publicly acknowledged, scheduled, as soon as they have the general election out of the way. But £125 can he cope with £1.5 So if we vote no, I was asked in question time, what will the Scots do if they vote no? I said, bitterly regret it by 2016. <laughs> Now, I've listened to people in the House of Lords who uh, all tell us they're proud Scots. Helen Liddell, who used to be a Labour MP, now Lady Liddell. Yeah. Proud Scots, she said. What the hell are they proud about? PD loans. People in debt. 250,000 of our children living in poverty. 50,000 families in Edinburgh living below the poverty line in one of the richest cities in Western Europe. What is there to be proud about of a Scotland of that particular character? I'm not proud about it. I want to change it for the better. That's why I'm voting yes on the 18th of September. Now, what matters, I'm a socialist, they make no bones about it. I want a yes vote because I believe we've got a better chance of getting a socialist policy in an independent Scotland. What matters to working class people is fairly simple but fundamental. If you can't sell your labour in the labour market, you're in a fix. You're kept by the state at the lowest possible level. So it's a question. Can we engineer ourselves in an independent Scotland to so organise what they call the labour market that the power of negotiation stands with the worker and not the employer? Because up until now, it's been the employer who's had the power to negotiate and not the worker. How do we do that? We start to create jobs, real jobs in our society. There's 157,000 families on the housing waiting list in this country. How do you solve that? You build houses. There's, you know, there isn't any other way to do it. And if you start building houses, somebody has to quarry the sand, somebody's got to manufacture the cement, somebody's got to manufacture the bricks, somebody's got to transfer them to the site, and somebody has got to put them on to make a house, and joiners and plumbers and slaters have got to be employed in order that it becomes habitable for the ordinary family. That's how you create work. How do you pay for it? Well, this is where my socialism comes in. There's a book out there written by me. I'm not touting it at the moment. <laughs> it's called In Place of Fear 2. Because the first In Place of Fear was written by an Iron Bevan. And an Iron Bevan said, the greatest armament in a socialist is audacity. The audacity 
to think the way the establishment tells you you can't think, and the audacity to do what the establishment tells you you cannot do. And we can build those houses without spending one single penny more. And we do that by bringing in the private finance initiative people who are robbing our health service and our education service of billions of pounds. You bring them in. And I'm told Margot argued this with John Swinney. And he said to her, oh, Margot, John's very conservative. <laughs> oh, cautious. Margot, the problem is that the ones that drew up the contracts actually allow only one party to the contract to ask for it to be reopened, and that's them, not me. Well, bring them in and say to them, we would like you to ask us to ask you <laughs> if you would renegotiate the contract. <laughs> They're going to say no. And so you say to them, well, that's easy. We'll just tax you at 30% from now until the end of the contract because we will have the power in a socialist legislator in Edinburgh and we take that money and we build houses, we house the homeless families and we create jobs. That's a very simple way to do it. There's another way and I want to talk about the stuff that makes the Scots somewhat embarrassed, the oil. We have been in a prison of lies about the oil since the first drop arrived on the mainland. But what I want you to, to talk to you about is what we can do with that oil. You know, there's a woman called Janie Buchan, who was a great labor luminary, who went on television and actually said, it can't be Scotland's oil, we didn't put it there. I've worked in the Arab world, and when I tell my Arab friends that, they say we didn't put it there either, but by jinx. <laughs> now, all our debate has been about the oil tax revenues. That's not how I see it. What about the black stuff itself? We should have a Scottish National Oil Corporation that owns oil in our North Sea. Not only that, think of what we can do with just a small proportion of the black stuff itself. Suppose our policy, and this is what I believe a socialist policy would be, was to take a portion of the oil going through Grangemouth and selling to our community petrol and diesel and jet fuel for aircraft at a much cheaper rate than we pay just now. We can do that if we want to, if we've got the power to do it, and think of the effect it would have. First of all, it puts money into the pockets of families. It means our transport system, the whole of our transportation system, becomes much more competitive with the rest of Europe and is a boon to our economy inside. And think what that would do to the tourist industry. A lot of our tourism actually comes from the north of England. Man, wife, two wains and a car coming north. They hardly ever go beyond the line Glasgow and Edinburgh because of the cost of going on up into the highlands. Think what it would matter to them if we had very cheap petrol and diesel. And think what it would do to Edinburgh and Glasgow airports if we could offer cheaper jet fuel than anyone else in Europe. It would give us the opportunity to have those direct flights to various parts of the world which we are denied just now and has a deleterious effect upon our economy. That's what we can do when we control our own destiny our own country and its resources. But it's a question of audacity. Now, Margot, in the tribute today, one of the things she said was, be better than you think you are. Be better than you think you are. 
One of the great tragedies of Scotland is that we have bought the myth of our own inadequacy. How many times have we been told, you're too small, you're too poor, you've got to hold the hand of cousin England or down you go. That has been driven into us generation after generation to the point where lots of Scots actually believe they can run their own country. Now that's a remarkable fact inside our democracy. But we can run our own country better than the hooligans and the fools down there. <laughs> what I'm trying to do in this campaign, and what Margot tried to do, was inject into the Scottish working class the majority in this country. We are the majority in Scotland, we're not the majority inside the UK. I'm trying to inject self-confidence and self-belief in the Scottish working class. And when we've got self-confidence and self-belief, we are able to take control of our own country. I'm working class. I left Air Academy without a single certificate to my name. I hardly went the last three years. <laughs> the rector brought me and my pal Bobby Hislop in and told us we'd make nothing of ourselves in the world to come. Bobby became a major engineer and I became a modest member of parliament. But in 1979, John Smith, Margot MacDonald and I went to debate down in the Oxford Union. And there they were, the Eton and Harrow educated people in this wonderful Oxford Union with the fingers inside the waistcoats as they pontificated. <laughs> as we left the debate, I just happened to be walking along with the president of the Oxford Union and I said to him, where do I pick up my PhD? <laughs> and he said, what? I said, where do I get my PhD? I, I don't understand you. I said, listen, if you are the creme de la creme in there, and I'm from the Scottish working class, I should get a PhD at the door compared to you. <laughs> now, some folk, some folk would put that down as arrogance. But we need a bit of Scottish working class arrogance, especially in this campaign. Yeah. What do they tell us? They start off by saying, of course, we recognise Scotland can be a viable economic entity and nation. And then on every single policy, tell us we can't do it and it will be disaster. If we have the arrogance to have belief in ourselves, then we can dismiss that as absolute nonsense. We have great responsibility on the 18th September. This isn't about Alex Salmond. Alex mortal, the nation's immortal. This is about my grandchildren and your grandchildren and children not as yet born. Whether they will live in a society where social justice and equality are the pillars upon which it is built, or whether they will continue to live in a poverty society of low pay, low ambitions, and low horizons. That's the choice between yes and no in this referendum. And the responsibility we all have, individually, none of us can dodge it for a single moment. Between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. on the 18th of September, you and me are sovereign. For the first time ever, the people in Scotland are sovereign. We will decide in those 15 hours the fate of our nation. If at one minute past 10, we've given that sovereignty away, we've given away the future of our grandchildren. If at one minute past 10, <laughs> if at one minute past 10, 
We have kept that sovereignty. Let it ring out throughout the land from the working class of Scotland. Our time has finally come.